Welcome to Digital Transformers, the show that connects you with what you need to build, manage, and operate your digital supply chain. Join your host in a timely discussion on new and future business models with industry-leading executives. The show will reveal global customer expectations, real-world deployment challenges, and the value of advanced business technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and robotic process engineering. And now, we bring you Digital Transformers. Hello, everyone. This is Kevin L. Jackson, and welcome to Digital Transformers on Supply Chain Now. You know, on today's interview, I have the rare opportunity to talk about two of my favorite things, space and cloud computing, where we're going to find out why these things go together through an exciting conversation with Mr. Carl Horn, Vice President, Cloud Portfolio and Strategy at SES Satellites. Welcome to Digital Transformers, Carl. Well, thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to speak with you, and by extension, your listeners and your oh, viewers. Oh, no. Thank you very much. You know, SES Satellites, it, it may not be a household word to us here in the United States, but uh, it has over 70 satellites in two different orbits. They were It was founded in 1985 and is Europe's first private satellite operator. Uh, their goal is to combine satellite connectivity and ground infrastructure to deliver fast, reliable connectivity nearly anywhere in the world. I actually saw a video about some service you're providing to the Galapagos Island. The, the woman that it ran the hotel was saying she wouldn't have a business without SES. So, so Call, however, is right here in the Washington, D.C. area, not far from me. In fact, they have a facility about 20 minutes from my home here in Manassas, Virginia. So, Carl, how did you wind up working with SES? Well, um, I have a long history of working in the in the telecoms mm -hmm. industry. Um, not long enough that I would go back to 1985 <laughs> when SES was founded, but but I do have some years under my belt. Um, many of those years in the telecom space was was working for um, the vendor mm -hmm. community. So that's companies that sell equipment and solutions to service providers uh, that then actually deliver the connectivity value to consumers and businesses. And really just as part of my professional evolution, I wanted to spend time in that service provider environment, um, a little bit closer to the end users of the technology as it were. And so when the opportunity came along to work for a for SES, I jumped in with both feet. You know, it's it's space after all. Yeah. So uh, I mean, out of Luxembourg, right? Uh, but your your bio, your bio, however, shows that you have spent some time with Sienna in the Asian Pacific region. I used to live in the Philippines when I was in the Navy. Uh, that that company, Sienna, is is a telecommunications leader. It it, it I guess it helped you uh, with your work here at SES. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're all we're all in, in a very real sense we're the sum of our past experiences, right? So, uh, working with Sienna, which which is a uh, telecommunications equipment mm -hmm. vendor uh, company, I mean, it helped me in a couple of different ways. But I think probably the most significant is that it gave me a chance to work with uh, network operators really all around the world, not just in North America or Asia Pacific, um, and really gain a better understanding of their business mm -hmm. models and and how they choose to leverage technology to implement their go-forward network architectures in support of those business models. And um, obviously, if you know Sienna, their focus is on fiber networking solutions, terrestrial networking. But, but now with SES, I'm, I'm able to bring perspective to our customers as to how next-generation satellite technologies uh, can work alongside or can augment terrestrial networks to form more of a hybrid yeah. network that really maximizes reach and, and, and availability of, of, of the services. So I, I think these go forward network architectures are pretty important to get right um, as, as next generation uh, applications take hold with uh, cloud computing, IOT, 5G, and, and, and all of the digital applications that ride on top of that. So a lot of what I did with Sienna is examine those dynamics in a fiber networking context. And now I'm pretty much doing the same in a satellite communications context. 
Well, the the, uh, the world is rolling out. All the telecommunications uh, companies in the world are rolling out 5G. And this, this hybrid telecommunications environment that connects everything to the internet is really critical to any, any future, the future of any business. So, but you have been associated with cloud computing for quite a while and cloud computing is kind of foundational, wouldn't you say? Um, how did, uh, how did you get into cloud computing? Um, because it's just now that many of these, uh, uh, communications providers are, you know, uh, developing and deploying cloud native uh, solutions. Mm. So I, I came to me in a dream. <laughs> I love that. No. Um, so, um, well, actually, I, I sort of already touched on, you know, how, how did I get into cloud computing? And you're, and you're absolutely right. You're going to get technologies like 5G and, and that are establishing themselves, mm-hmm. et cetera. And in many cases, it's about how do I get ubiquitous connectivity to the internet but sort of another element to consider is it's also ubiquitous connectivity into the cloud. Um, so cloud adoption isn't isn't a new trend. Um, it continues to grow mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, you know, first we have end users um, that are using more cloud applications and cloud services, and I think we all see this in our in our professional and our personal lives. Um, but also from the perspective of a network operator, and SES yeah. is one of those. Um, you know, for the past decade or so, we've, we've been building networks differently. We've been using the cloud as an architectural template um, to build functionality that previously might have been dedicated boxes and devices. But now, to simplify, they're essentially software images that are hosted in data centers. They're basically a cloud application or cloud implementation. So in both cases, whether it's for end user yeah. services or for cloudified network architectures, the network needs to adapt to account for new scale. Uh, new traffic patterns, and, and I sort of say there's two things, right? One is connecting users into the cloud and also in, interconnecting the cloud points um, on scale. Right. And so to learn how to do that better, I had to spend several years understanding what cloud architectures look like, uh, how the ecosystem of cloud providers work, and, and ultimately uh, the best way to construct a network that underpins the cloud. And, and if I can paraphrase Bob Marley, no network, no cloud. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. But SES has been providing, like you said, uh, satellite communication services for quite a while. And, and you know, 85 is like, uh, you know, three centuries ago in satellite years. <laughs> but 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 you today, you you partner with seven out of the top 10 global telecom companies, and you support 58 government organizations. And this, this is what gets me. You provide connectivity, internet connectivity, to four of the world's six major cruise lines. And, and broadcasters, you broadcast today to over a billion TV viewers worldwide. I mean, your footprint in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. That's a very impressive reach. So how is SES expanding this entrenched position in the satellite market to, to address the cloud computing opportunity? Well, uh, I mean, obviously our customers uh, that we serve today and have served for a while, um, you know, th- those customers, those end user communities, they're, they're obviously uh, adopting cloud and adopting digital projects that depend on the cloud. So one sort of vector of growth for us, obviously, is we, we're underpinning more and more cloud applications, even within our same market segments that we had served, um, you know, for, for some time now. So uh, previously, when a satellite connection might have just been a broadband connection or maybe a, a path to the internet, now that that connection is uh, in many cases now, um, you know, a wide area connection from edge cloud applications into regional or core cloud uh, applications. So we're, our, our connections are be used, being used in, in increasingly more of a cloud context. As part of expanding, you know, our, our entrenched position, you know, beyond building on, on, the, on the existing uh, customer mm-hmm. bases and supporting digital transformations there, um, you know, we're, we're seeing more ecosystem plays. I mean, we're participating in more ecosystem plays. Um, so we've formed some strategic partnerships with uh, major cloud service providers, 
and uh, we've publicly announced Microsoft, AWS, but there are some other ones that you would recognize where we've got some partnerships on how to more elegantly connect into their environments and domains and bring customer cloud traffic directly into those domains for the best uh, for the best user experience. Um, and in other cases, it's uh, working with some more vertically integrated solutions integrators. So <clears throat> people that can assemble network infrastructure plus cloud infrastructure uh, plus digital infrastructure and applications for more of a turnkey solution for um, powering digital transformation projects. And so we've announced a couple of partnerships with uh, some of those actors as well. So I, I would say really the, the answer is, is in summary to, mm -hmm. twofold, right? The first one is our customers are doing cloud motions. SES itself as a company is doing cloud motions and our customers are as well. So we're adapting uh, our portfolio um, and our service offerings uh, to account for that dynamic. And the second one is we're integrating ourselves more into you know, the ecosystem uh, of actors that, that, that ultimately provide these digital, digital solutions, these cloud hosted solutions. Um, all of that I think is opening up great opportunity for SES. Oh, wow, that, it is uh, a, you know, really surprising the, that your business has really focused on areas where you wouldn't think there's a lot of service like island nations and cruise liners uh you know in the middle of the ocean huh these are seems to me to be very unique use cases that you're able to support with with your your cloud satellite based cloud solution so how how do you work with with your customers in Micronesia or in, on the Galapagos Islands, um, or, or you know, if I'm in the you know on the Princess Cruise Liner, how, you know, how how does that work? Um, so first, it's probably uh, helpful to, to to kind of draw a distinction between a couple of types of services that SES offers. I mean, because of who we are, what we do, and we can pretty much see the whole planet with our networking uh, infrastructure. And there, there is a significant amount of what we do, which is effectively closing digital divides, right? This is bringing connectivity where connectivity just didn't really exist, maybe more on a consumer basis. Um, helping uh, telcos and MNOs extend their networks into underserved areas. Um, helping light up uh, areas like the Galapagos, yeah. right? And give them broadband connections to really change uh, somebody's experience when they're even in that most remote of areas. Uh, digital inclusion and social inclusion projects. That's a big part of what SES does. And, you know, my, my personal comment on that is this is one of those things that feels really good for me working for SES is the ability to, to help close that digital divide. In the context of today, though, there's another set of, of, of uh, or another class, class of uh, connectivity services we deliver, which are really much more towards, you know, industrial operations. Um, so these are, these are industrial operations that are doing... Uh, you know, pretty intensive digital projects, um, but you know they may be in difficult to reach places. Uh, oil and gas rigs that might be on the high seas, uh, um, commercial shipping fleets that might be navigating you know across the globe, uh, um, air, airplanes, and basically anything that flies or floats. There's really kind of no other way to talk right, to right. Uh, other than a on uh, a satellite connection. Um, so there's another class of services that we deliver, which are much more um, industrial or enterprise focused. Um, okay. So let me highlight a little bit of the use cases there with our cloud solutions, because that's really where they apply most. Um, so I'll give I'll give some examples of projects that we've been involved in. I'll start with maybe a commercial shipping uh, mm -hmm. example. So um, moving forward through the course of the next decade. Um, the International Maritime Organization is going to start mandating some uh, uh, energy efficient efficiency targets for vessels over a certain tonnage. Um, meet those efficiency targets are basically defined. So um, fleets are thinking, how do I use technology? How do I use IoT and maybe cloud-hosted analytics um, to gain better understanding on, on the operations of the ship and how I can optimize my processes uh, to optimize my fuel consumption? And this includes things like, uh, you know, linking into global data sets like weather patterns that, that can help uh, also plan optimal routing, uh, which, which certainly can impact the more efficient fuel consumption. So that's an example of, you know, a use case where 
where cloudification is being applied uh, in, a, in a commercial environment, one that we serve, um, in, in order to gain some business goals and, and effectively uh, help, help meet those uh, emergency, uh, emerging uh, energy efficiency targets. Yeah. Uh, um, I mentioned uh, oil and gas okay. rigs as another oh, example. Oh, they're in the so middle of the ocean too. Very highly <laughs> instrumented uh, rigs uh, and platforms. You know, you're talking about, you know, tens of thousands, 100,000 plus sensors and devices, and, and they can collect an awful lot of raw data, you know, oceanic data, seismic data, uh, environmental data, which by itself is just not that useful. So, uh, typically, what energy companies want to do is they want to take that data volume and, and upload it into big data handling engines, which are hosted oh, wow, in the cloud, yeah. um, then create um, metadata sets and geospatial metadata sets that then can be fed back into the sites um, and that can really aid in terms of much more targeted exploration and much more targeted extraction. Uh, you know, ultimately, what that drives is, is uh, better yields. For the resources that that are that are being extracted and uh, much much greener operations, which is uh, top of mind uh, for just about any everybody. Wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, if you'll permit me, there's maybe yeah, one more example yeah, I'll absolutely. share with you. Um, this one is uh, less about a commercial sector, maybe more in the uh -huh. public sector. Um, and this is something that we've we've done with some of our ecosystem partners, is some disaster response applications because. With satellite, we can we can apply connectivity in what's known as an on the pause model. Um, so there literally would be um, a truck, a mobile truck configured that has satellite uplinks, but also the truck would carry on board um, edge compute resources and private 5G capability, and that can lead then to the responders that might go to a disaster site having uh, you know comms connections uh, right there locally. Uh, for any devices they may be carried, but also any wearables they may have for uh, IoT sensors or, or video cameras. And with that connectivity bubble, then, um, that really promotes man-to-man on-site communications for more efficient responses, but also site-to-headquarters um, for, for better command and control of the response activity. Um, and further, when you use the communications, or sorry, when you use yeah. the cloud um, as, as a communications platform, something like Microsoft Teams, then this also promotes the right uh, resiliency and availability of site to cloud communication. So all of that coming together, you know, really is, is a very powerful tool to throw at a, a disaster response scenario. With SES, our role obviously is to create that wide, hour, uh, wide area network connection um, that has the right reach, the right performance to allow all of these cloud-based applications to function and function well, no matter where they are. Wow, I want to I want to pull some more on that that string with respect to uh, disaster recovery efforts. I um I understand your O3B Empower service is key to that. In fact, I had the opportunity to watch your launch on Sunday, just a few few days ago. So, um, how does this capability um, really address disaster recovery efforts? Because if a lot of your customers are actually islands, the, uh, the threat caused by global warming is really top of mind for them. And I actually run an operation for the National Digit Foundry, and, and we have a work group built around improving climate change related disaster response by using things like blockchain and digital assets, which of course uh, layer on top of cloud computing. This makes it a very particular interest to me. Could you share any um, additional specific examples about how uh, O3B Empower is, is useful in disaster response scenarios? Sure. Um, I mean, I'll preface it all with uh, uh, O3BM Power is is our uh, our next generation of medium Earth mm -hmm. orbit uh, uh, satellites, and it really delivers, I think, uh, a huge step function in the capacity and and the performance and capability of the bandwidth that can be delivered over over satellite. Um, it, it can now deliver capacities that essentially approximate fiber in the sky. Um, so it really is a very capable wide area network connection which is one of the things that helps some of these use cases really do uh, 
cloud and digital adoption because you have the quality of connection that can do that now. So I've already touched a little bit on a first responder scenario um, for satellite connections, extending private 5G connections. And, and actually that was for an island nation. It was it was for um, the response uh, the response agencies in, in oh, Taiwan, okay. uh, which is very much uh, subject yeah. to typhoon uh, climate issues as well as seismic events. Um, so uh, there's a number of different scenarios where a first responder agency, uh, you know, really needs the best tools uh, tools uh, at their disposal. Um, another example that we're working on now um, involves uh, wildfire responses. Uh, in this case, it's not so much connected people, mm -hmm. and that may be part of the response, but maybe connected drones. So connected via you know, a 5G bubble um, that, that pulls in the... Uh, uh, the sensor, the sensory information and video information that might be coming from the drones that are flying around a wildfire um, event, uh, taking that information and backhauling it over a high-performance satellite link, like what Empower would offer, and then feed that environmental data into a high-performance computing grid that can do rapid simulations um, of the course or the trajectory of a fire and guide not only the response teams, but also guide evacuation responses. And you know, think uh, fairly recently how that sort of a solution might have impacted the recent wildfire response that happened in yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Um, there would have been more lives saved. There would have been more property saved. So uh, we're working with some uh, ecosystem partners on setting that up, and and, and hopefully that that becomes a you know productized capability that can be made available to uh, to responding agencies. Well, there um, are some. Um, uh, um, what, yeah. One more one yeah. more example, if I can, I guess. Uh, you know, here in the United States, we worked with one of the major cloud service providers that their their job wasn't really to be first responders to, to, to the event itself, to the climate event, but how to restore capability locally. And in this case, um, enterprise services and cloud capability locally. So, again, using, um, using medium Earth orbit connectivity, uh, like what Empower would deliver, um, this cloud service provider was able to stand up uh, uh, edge compute and modular edge compute capabilities uh, within the affected area, uh, link those back to their core cloud over the high performance satellite link, and really get some of their enterprise grade cloud services back and running so that businesses could start operating again uh, in the affected area. Wow. So that was a little bit yeah. different, but you know, still, still another example of you know, space-enabled digital deployments that can improve disaster response. And, and, of course, those digital deployments can can certainly include functions like blockchain and, and feature other digital assets, like, like what you were mentioning you focused on. This really changes how you think about a telecommunications infrastructure, because uh, especially in disaster recovery, a lot of times everyone's talking about, we lost this cell tower, or how do we bring a cell on wheels? But... Here you are with O3BM Power with the the ultimate cell tower sitting up in uh, uh, mid Earth orbit. Uh, this is this is awesome, and this really helps in digital transformations. Uh, I mean, globally, those those opportunities that you said uh, for um, different companies to really uh, change, especially. The ocean liners, um, uh, those are really impressive. Do, are, are the companies thinking more about the um, high bandwidth um, space connectivity um, as opposed to the uh, Earth-based terrestrial towers? Um, yes, they are, but the caveat there... I don't think is as opposed okay, to. So blend. Um, I think you know we'll, what we tend to see is digital transformation projects can now be executed where it really wasn't possible before because of limitations of mm -hmm. the network. And the digital transformations uh, really are powered by the cloud, and there's no network, no cloud. That means if you didn't have a good network, you really didn't stand a chance to uh, to really execute on digital transformation projects. Um, you know, kind of in some of these remote or, or on the move sites. Um, you know, when I when I think about what Empower yeah. does in terms of helping our our customers execute on their on their transformations, you know, it's always helpful for me to say that there's 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 a uh, 
a layered hierarchy of capability here. The digital transformations, they're, the way I think about them is that they're a way to leverage um, a basket of technologies, ultimately, that when you assemble them, they drive business outcomes as ways people can save money or make money. And, and that basket of technologies these days includes things like virtualization, includes 5G, IoT, it includes new uh, visualization techniques that we see, you know, uh, augmented and virtual reality, digital twinning is a pretty hot topic these days we encounter a lot. Um, but also some of these technologies are about data handling and data handling on scale, right? big data engines, analytic engines, machine learning, and of course the big buzzword these days is AI. Uh, and again, these these technologies are largely implemented and deployed through yeah. the cloud, um, and the cloud depends on a network, right? And this the network really has to do two things, I think, and do them very well. Um, first, it needs to be able to connect anywhere to the cloud so that no matter where you are, you are one hop away from the cloud. But it also needs to be able to extend the cloud to anywhere. And so this aligns a lot with... with uh, um, distributed cloud architectures and the trend towards more and more edge computing and edge cloud instances, even right out to the most remote sites, like the ones that are served by SES uh, connections. Wow. So, um, you know, if, 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 the, if the network needs to then uh, serve that cloud yeah. very well, then it, it has to do things like scale up. It has to do things like provide ubiquitous reach, ubiquitous access. It has to be able to network east to west, as they say mm -hmm. in cloud world, right? So being able to uh, network in a symmetrical fashion from the edge all the way up to the core or, or push information from the core all the way out to the edge. Um, it has to really drive and deliver on enterprise or carrier grade um, cloud connections. These cannot be best effort connections. Um, and it has to have a level of dynamic behavior um, to effectively do what I call follow the workload, right? Everything happens in the cloud based on workloads and and workloads can be instantiated and, and, and released dynamically. They can be replicated um, for load balancing and resiliency regions, reasons. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're highly yeah. dynamic and, and the network has to match the dynamics of, of workload instantiation and placement. Uh, so we need a network that kind of lives and breathes <laughs> to be able to follow the workload. Um, the, all of that is just, you know, the, the base requirements yeah. of a network. And in satellite world in previous years, that was a little difficult to hit those targets, those those requirements. But here, here I think, is where Empower um, is a game changer for the industry and for SES because the agility, the scale, the programmability of, of this uh, satellite fleet really can deliver on those key requirements and, and be an enabler then for the digital transformation projects that, that our customers are interested in taking. <laughs> wow, no network, no cloud. I mean, for the, you've changed my life. Barb Marley and SES are gonna be forever linked in my mind. It was, it was so great to learn more about SES and uh, the MEO-based services. So uh, we're coming to the end of our time here, but how could the audience find out more about this sort of revolutionary leap in, in satellite-based connectivity? Well, the obvious place, of course, is to, uh, to, to start. It would be to visit our website, ses.com, and then there's a slash O3BM power, and you can learn more about the technology uh, you can see how our customers are leveraging it. Um, we've got a really cool little visualization app that sort of, sort of shows you how it works and uh, gives you a much more visual experience on, on, on how Empower is revolutionizing connectivity really across the various industry segments we serve. So absolutely start there. Jeez, this was an amazing interview. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Carl, for, for spending the time and to open our minds. No network, no cloud. So, so in closing, I would like to really invite everyone to check out the wide variety of, of industry thought leadership like this that we present here at SupplyChainNow.com. And you can find Digital Transformers and Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcasts. So be sure to subscribe. So on behalf of the entire team here at Supply Chain Now, this is Kevin L. Jackson wishing all of our listeners a bright and transformational future. We'll see you next time 
on Digital Transformers. Thanks, Carl. Thank you for supporting Digital Transformers and for being a part of our global Supply Chain Now community. Please check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com. Make sure you subscribe to Digital Transformers anywhere you listen to or view the show. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Digital Transformers.